A little while ago, I uploaded a video called Megalodon Sightings. A video that went through some alleged sightings of Megalodon, as well as some videos, photos, and a few other things. When I was uploading the video, I remember wondering if it would ever get to 100 views. To my astonishment and delight, the video has gotten hundreds of thousands of views. And with all those views came some comments. Some people agreed with me, and others disagreed. Some people brought up interesting points that maybe I didn't cover, or maybe didn't cover in enough detail. Others said that there was some evidence that I left out. So I thought I'd try and take another look and maybe respond to some of the points people brought up in the comments. Now, I probably won't show any individual comments because I don't want anyone to feel like I'm targeting them or trying to call them out or anything. And also because many comments had similar things. Now this video is probably going to be a bit long, so I'll try and break it down piece by piece with some timestamps if you just want to skip to certain parts. But before I do, I would just like to say thank you. Seriously, I really appreciate everyone who took the time to watch and or to comment. Whether or not you agreed with me, the fact that you took the time to engage with the video in any way means so much. So again, thank you. Anyway, Megalodon. So you might want to check out the original video if you haven't already, but basically I sort of took the approach that Megalodon living in modern times is very unlikely. And many people commented things like, you don't know, you can't be sure, and how can you be absolutely certain? And to this I would say, yeah, you're right. After all, only a Sith deals in absolutes. I could be wrong about all of this, and honestly, I kind of hope I am. How awesome would it be if in the next blue planet or something, they had a part where they found living Megs. Imagine being able to cave dodge with these gigantic sharks. That would be really great. Assuming that it was safe, of course. But yeah, I definitely can't say for certain if there are or aren't living Megs. I just think that the evidence would suggest that it's not very likely. But hey, what are some of the counterpoints? Let's start with the one that comes up a lot. Maybe even the most. The ocean is massive. And a lot of it is unexplored. I thought I touched on this a little bit in the original video, but maybe I should go into it in a bit more detail. So firstly, just how much is unexplored? Some comments said less than 20%, others said less than 10%, and some have said less than 5%, and some have said even less than 1%. Less than 1% seems really low, but what is the correct answer? Well, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, more than 80% remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. And National Geographic gives the same figure too. Oceana says the same number too, more than 80% unexplored. But on another part of their website, they say humans have only explored 5% of the world's oceans. What the? So maybe not as unexplored as some people say, but 80 to 95%, which is still a huge amount. Whatever percentage you want to go with, the bottom line is that the majority of our oceans are unexplored. So couldn't the Meg just be in the 80 to 95% that we haven't checked yet? Perhaps. But let's consider the great white shark for a moment. The amount of great whites living in the ocean today is a bit difficult to estimate. While they seem to be spotted more around places like the east coast of the USA, in other places like South Africa, they are becoming harder to find. It's estimated that there are a few thousand in the oceans today, which isn't very many. And yet, you and I have probably seen many high quality pictures and videos of great whites. Many different tour operators bring people out to see the sharks in different locations. But if there are only a few thousand of these sharks, and they are smaller than the Meg, and we have a huge unexplored ocean, how can we consistently find them? Well, we know that they like to eat seals, so we can go to places where seals are abundant. Guadalupe Island is a major breeding site for fur seals, so many people go there to see great whites. A rise in grey seal populations around areas like Cape Cod has also given rise to more white shark sightings. Recently, I also started reading a book called The Devil's Teeth about great white sharks off of the Farallon Islands and the scientists that study them. Again, the big reason that the sharks are there is because there are five species of seals that live on these islands. And in some cases, the scientists were able to record nearly 80 shark attacks on seals in a single season. And this was without using any chum. So if we go to what Megalodon preyed on, 
we should find some megalodon. Fossil evidence shows us that megalodon ate large marine mammals like dolphins and whales. So if we go to dolphin and or whale hotspots, shouldn't we at least, on some occasions, see some megalodon interactions? We think that megs may have bumped whales, and there is even some evidence that the meg may have been able to breach. Many scientists study whales and dolphins in the wild, and not only that, but whale watching is a popular activity. According to the Animal Welfare Institute, over 13 million people across over 100 countries go whale watching every year. Now, you might say that it feeds on dead whales that sink to the ocean floor, and it makes sense that the meg would have scavenged from a dead whale. We see many sharks do this today. But megalodon would have to eat a lot. To maintain its large size, it's estimated that the megalodon had to eat two and a half thousand pounds of food every day. Even smaller sharks that need less food can't completely rely on finding dead whales. Some fossil evidence also suggests that megs may have hunted. A paper published in 2018 described a rib of cetacean from the Pliocene that showed damage resembling bite marks, with the bone woven over the marks. The researchers think that the animal was recovering from bone trauma caused by those bite marks. The marks matched up well with large serrated teeth, suggesting the attacker could potentially have been a megalodon. So perhaps we should be able to predict where megalodon is based on its hunting habits. But there are also other ways we can predict where they would be. In 2010, scientists revealed that they had found a megalodon nursery in Panama, and since then, more sites have been found with a quote, wide geographical area that include the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Pacific Basin. Some of the megalodon living in these nurseries were likely about one month old, that measured about 13 feet, four meters in length, and other older juveniles measured up to 36 feet, 11 meters in length. Now, these nurseries are similar to what great white sharks do today, but you might say, sure, but wasn't it difficult to find the great white nurseries in the Atlantic? Well, fair enough. But what else do we know about the Meg nurseries? Well, fossil evidence also suggests that millions of years ago, the same region had shallow shorelines, warm water, and flourishing marine life. So young and juvenile megalodon, ranging from four to 11 meters, would need to stay around shallow, warm coastlines with a bunch of other marine life, probably until they were adults and ready to venture out into the deeper ocean. So how long did they need to stay there? Well, apparently, growth rings in megalodon's vertebrae show that the sharks reached adult size after about 25 years. So they might have been there for decades. These kinds of nurseries were vital for the survival of the species as it gave them a chance to grow and develop in a safer environment. Now you might say, well, what would a megalodon have to worry about today? Well, orca attack great white sharks and they can travel in family groups, sometimes with 40 individuals. The smaller megs might also be in danger from bigger sharks, like a big great white or another adult meg. You'd think if these nurseries were around today, which again would have been found around the world, they would have been found. Warm, shallow coastal waters seem like the type of places you'd be more likely to bump into humans. You'd think a coastal area with multiple megalodons, some over 30 feet long, would have been found by now. Unless they've drastically changed and evolved, but I'll get to that later. Also, a quick aside. In the original video, I said megalodon were found around shallow coastal waters. But of course, adult megalodon did venture out into the open ocean as well. I should have made that more clear, so my bad. Well, we've got an update. As I was making this video, a new paper came out that revisited the idea of the nurseries. I'll post a link to the full paper below if you want to read it for yourself. But my rough summary is that basically, they found that meg teeth discovered in what would have been warmer water with an average surface temperature of something like 24 degrees Celsius or so were significantly smaller than teeth found in what would have been colder regions further north with an average surface temperature of something closer to 21 degrees Celsius. So essentially, the nurseries might just be a separate population of megs that lived in warmer climates that didn't get as big as the population of megs that lived further north in colder climates. This would suggest that Megalodon may have been an example of Bergman's rule. Bergman's rule states that within a broadly distributed taxonomic clade, populations and species of larger size are found in colder environments while populations and species of smaller size are found in warmer regions. 
For example, white-tailed deer are bigger in Canada than Florida, and you can also see this with penguins and bears too. Now, the study does say that it's still possible that O. megalodon could have utilized nursery areas, so I wouldn't throw the nursery theory completely out the window, especially since we know some modern-day sharks do use nurseries. I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned the study since it came out recently. But regardless, for our purposes, it doesn't really change anything, because if this new study is accurate, we should find slightly smaller megs, about 30 feet, in warm water, and in colder water further north, we should find the big 60-footers. Anyway, just a quick update. The thing about the megalodon is that while some shark species are endemic to specific areas, megalodon were found around the world. Looking at the known behavior of megalodon, we should have encountered one by now. The other thing about the whole, most of our oceans are unexplored, who knows what lurks at the depths of the sea, is, while this is true, I feel like it doesn't really get you anywhere. It's like I said in the original video, why do people say Megalodon is in the unexplored sea, but not a bunch of other extinct sharks? In fact, couldn't I just insert any extinct fish and say it lives in the unexplored parts of the ocean? Someone commented and said, the reason people think Meg is in the unexplored parts of the ocean is because of the sightings. Well, that's fair enough, and maybe for some people that is why they think that, but many of the Meg comments I've seen, not just on my video, but other videos, and on sites like Reddit and Facebook, and even people I've spoken to in real life, usually say, well, most of the ocean is unexplored, as the reason why they think Megalodon could still be out there, rather than because of a sighting. And I think this leads back to the fact that Megalodon is so popular today, because it's the biggest shark of all time, and shows up in a lot of media. But anyway, like I said, Megalodon lived all over the ocean. Well, how do we know this? Well, it's because we find meg teeth on every continent, except Antarctica. Megalodon teeth are pretty common, and we find them a lot. Speaking of teeth... Many comments said that I got the age of the meg teeth wrong in the video when I said they were 2.6 million years old. And actually, it looks like I was wrong. Now, a paper in 2014 compiled records worldwide to determine the extinction of Megalodon, and came to the conclusion that O. Megalodon most likely became extinct by around two and a half million years ago. But the researcher, Robert Bosnaker, as well as some of his colleagues, re-examined previous evidence, and they also created a compendium of other finds. They found that some of the earlier samples were either broken or chemically altered by phosphorus. This would suggest that their younger age may not be accurate. Others had been misidentified, or the dating has since been improved and refined. It would appear from their findings that no meg fossil can be dated younger than about 3.6 million years, with margins of error that mean the date could be as young as 3.2 million and possibly as old as 4.1 million. So in the original video when I said 2.6 million years ago, the most recent evidence that I can find would suggest that it went extinct a million years before that. But people in the comments were actually asking about thousand year old meg teeth. I got a surprisingly large amount of comments that asked me about 10,000 year old meg teeth. I presume people are referring to the teeth that were discovered by the HMS Challenger. When I searched online for a thousand year old meg teeth, these are the only ones that came up. Now, I already mentioned these teeth in the original video, but the video is kind of long, so maybe people just didn't get to that part. But basically, to summarize, in 1875, the HMS Challenger found some meg teeth, and then they were dated by Vladimir Chernesky in 1959. He got dates of about 11,000 and 24,000 years. But the method he used was that he measured the layer of manganese dioxide that had accumulated on the teeth. The problem is this method isn't very accurate, and we wouldn't date meg teeth this way anymore. We use more accurate methods that give us millions of years, not thousands. In the fake documentary, Megalodon the Monster Shark Lives, the actor playing the marine biologist says that meg teeth were found in 10,000 year old sediment. Maybe people were referring to these teeth. I'll talk a little bit more about this show in a bit, but it's a fictional show, so I don't think this was real. So, if we use the previous 2019 study and take its younger estimate of 3.2 million years, that's 3.2 million years without a megalodon tooth. And megalodon had rows of large teeth that it was shedding all the time. Megalodon fossils are pretty plentiful today, so you'd think we'd find their teeth, or some other evidence.
Well, many people have commented about this picture taken off the coast of South Africa during the Second World War that shows a U-boat beside a huge shark fin and tail in the water. The measurement between the fin and tail is apparently 64 feet in length. Well, this picture also came from the Discovery Channel mockumentary Megalodon the Monster Shark Lives. I mentioned in the original video, and a few minutes ago, that this isn't a real documentary. The marine biologist in the show, Colin Drake, is played by an actor named Darren Mayer. You can even look at his IMDb page. He's been in a variety of shows and movies. Okay, but what about the picture itself? Well, there are a few issues. It has an odd watermark that apparently wouldn't have been used. The picture has a sepia tone, but sepia was usually used for family photos as an extra processing step on black and white photos to try and make them look better. The alleged shark is 64 feet from tail to fin, meaning the full length of the shark would have been even more gigantic. And despite the massive size and power of an animal this big, the fins don't really create any waves or wakes, seeming like they were just photoshopped on. Also, the biggest smoking gun is that people have found archival footage of U-boats in the North Atlantic that seem to match up pretty well with this picture. Except, there is no fin. Now, the footage I found is pretty low res, so you can't see all of the detail. But if I take a freeze frame, add a sepia tone, and crudely photoshop in some fins, I can get sort of close. Again, I just have a low res version of the footage, and I am not very good with photoshop. Imagine what Discovery Channel could create with all of its resources. George Monbois, a writer for the Guardian newspaper, reached out to the Discovery Channel to see the original photo, or any proof that the photo was real, but as far as I know they've never gotten back to him. And again, it's in a fake documentary with actors, so the authenticity of this picture is highly questionable to say the least. Some people have commented that you can see pictures of Megalodon on Google Earth. Well, I searched online and there is an image floating around of what looks like a very big shark swimming beside Cat Islands in the Bahamas in 2017. But others pulled up the same spot from 2017 and there is nothing there. It turns out this image was a photoshop. Cat Island is a popular destination for tourists who want to relax on the beach or go swimming, fishing, sailing and diving. There are even shark diving tours but they're to see oceanic white tips, not megalodon. But anyway, we should be wary of pictures like this as they are reasonably easy for people to photoshop. Also, even if there is a real photo of a big shark on Google Earth, if it doesn't have a lot of detail, it's hard to rule out that it's not a whale shark or a basking shark. Many people in the comments told me that I should look up submarine or that I left out submarine. So what's submarine? Well, apparently this is a story that goes all the way back to the 70s about a large great white shark that frequented False Bay in South Africa. Great white sharks do inhabit that area, though the number spotted there has declined in recent years. But anyway, submarine was reported to be a very large great white shark. Some estimates I've read say 22 to 30 feet long. Some have said 25 to 35 feet long. Marine biologist and great white shark expert, Alison Towner, was asked about submarine in an interview with Seeker magazine. She has over 15 years of experience working with great white sharks, and she has cautioned about the size of submarine, especially when fighting it on a rod and reel. She also added, if one is standing on a boat, particularly a smaller boat, almost on level with the water, the shark can appear to be much bigger. A very big great white can approach 20 feet in length, and possibly a little over 20 feet, but 30 feet or more seems way too large. One of Allison's colleagues, Neil Hammerschlag, also a shark expert, said the maximum length great whites can attain is around 20 feet long, and there is no truth to reports of great whites reaching 30 feet in length or more. Taking into account media hype and sensationalism, it makes sense that the size may have been exaggerated too. So submarine was likely a big great white, maybe about 20 feet in length, that people may have overestimated or maybe exaggerated the size of. People in the comments have told me that there is a video of submarine taking out a boat off the coast of South Africa, off of Cape Town. There is? Well, I looked into it and it looks like this came from another Discovery Channel show called Shark of Darkness, Wrath of Submarine. So I watched the one hour and 22 minute show and like the Megalodon the monster shark lives, it's fake. The people in the show are actors, and you can look them up on IMDb, 
There's a 36-foot CGI Great White Shark in the show that was most likely created by the VFX studio Hammerhead Productions, as they are listed in the credits at the end, and they have done visual effects for Hollywood movies, and they've even created their own animated features. There's also just a lot of ridiculous things in this show. The incredibly gigantic Great White is supposed to be super intelligent and super evil. They call the shark cunning and devious, and say that its favorite meal is humans. Which doesn't make sense because sharks don't target humans, but the one in this fake documentary does. At one point in the show they find footage from an oil rig where the shark went vertical and stayed motionless in the water so that it could hide behind the oil rig and wait to attack a kid. It's kind of absurd. Though it is a myth that all sharks have to keep moving or they'll die, some sharks actually do have to keep swimming. These sharks are called obligate ram ventilators. They draw water in through their mouths and force it out through their gills. Now, not all sharks are obligate ram ventilators, but great whites are, so it can't just stay motionless in the water like this. In the show they mention this, but they try to explain it away by saying it's adapted because it's so intelligent. It reminded me a lot of that weird scene in the deep blue sea where the mako shark started swimming backwards. It just sort of bothers me that they show a great white as this evil monster shark that wants to attack and eat humans. While on rare occasions sharks do attack humans, we are a much greater threat to them than they are to us. Over a third of sharks and rays are endangered, and millions of sharks are killed by humans every year. Now, this isn't what this video is about, but if you are interested in helping sharks, I'll post some links below on things that we can do. Also, if you want to see an actual shark scientist talk about submarine, I'd recommend this video. There'll be a link below. The problem is that while Discovery Channel has made some good quality shark programs in the past, they have a tendency to create fake shows with a few vague disclaimers that some people think are real. The other problem is, clips from these fictionalized shows get edited into Megalodon Still Alive YouTube videos, but the videos often fail to mention that the clips are taken from these fake documentaries. There's a similar urban legend of a shark called the Black Demon of Cortez, but I talked about that in the original video. A few comments said that I either forgot or ignored that great white sharks were being eaten by a large shark around Australia. In 2009, there was a great white shark that was tagged by shark scientists, and four months later, its tag washed up on shore. The data from the tag indicated that something bigger ate the great white. Well, the great white that was eaten was about nine feet long, and scientists now believe that the shark was eaten by another, bigger great white shark, one closer to 16 feet long, which is a big shark, but it's not even the max size of a great white. The scientists realized that it was probably eaten by a big great white when they did a study and found that bigger sharks were migrating into that area. The body temperature of these big migrating great whites was the same as the data collected on the tag. They also estimate that a 16 foot long great white could easily pull off the same speed and trajectory captured on the tracking device. I also saw another news report from Australia where a great white was caught in nets and it had big bites taken out of it. But again, the bitten great white was about nine feet long and they said that the monster shark that attacked it was over five meters long. So again, a bit over 16 feet, which is big, but below the maximum length of a great white shark. And 16 feet is pretty small for a megalodon. There was also a photo floating around online a little while ago of a great white with a big scar on its back. Now this great white was supposed to be nearly 17 feet in length, so how did it get this scar? Well again, if you want to watch an actual shark scientist discuss this, I'll leave a link to the video. But it seems like the scar is healed, so it could have been bitten when it was much younger and the scar just stretched out. Or it could have been hit by a boat propeller. Also, I just wanted to mention really quick about the relation between Megalodon and the great white shark. Some people have commented that maybe Megalodon evolved into the great white shark. But as I mentioned in the original video, we can trace the lineage of boat sharks back to the Cretaceous, and great whites would have swam in the ocean with Megs. So Megalodon didn't evolve into a great white. Also, some comments criticized me for saying Megalodon looked like a big great white. Now, I did say a big great white with a stockier build, more squashed nose, and bigger pectoral fins. But yeah, I mean, this is all guesswork. I might be way off on this. Some people think it would look more like a big bull shark or a big sand tiger shark. We really don't know, so all we can do is make a best guess 
based on the evidence. I'll post a link below where I got my info for the look of the Meg, and I'll also post a link to a Benji Thomas video going through the different theories of what the Meg might have looked like. If you haven't seen the video yet, it's pretty good. First, the Megamouth Shark. This is a large shark growing up to over 18 feet long, and yet, it wasn't discovered until 1976. So this is evidence that big sharks can remain hidden for a long time. Well, I suppose so, but let's remember that this is a slow moving filter feeder shark that only comes closer to the surface at night. A megalodon on the other hand was an apex predator that hunted large cetaceans. Also, despite the megamouth being a rare, slow moving deep sea shark that only comes closer to the surface at night, we still have pictures and video of megamouths, and though rare, they have been observed about a hundred times since 1976. The first was found because it got tangled in a sea anchor of a US Navy ship, and others have been caught in nets too. If a shark three times this size was out there, hunting, you think it would have got tangled up in nets at some point. Of course, I do think there are probably many shark species yet to be discovered, but remember, about half of known shark species are less than a meter long. Even if some discovered sharks are big, I think they'll be more like the Megamouth or some other deep sea shark. A slow moving shark with a slow metabolism, which isn't the Megalodon, unless it changed and adapted, but I'll get to that. And then we have Coelacanth, a fish that was thought to have gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, only to be found in 1938. It is a fascinating and incredible discovery, but keep in mind that it is only found off the east coast of Africa and in the waters off Indonesia. Also, coelacanths spend most of the day resting in underwater caves that are hundreds of meters down, and only come out to feed at night. While the coelacanth can grow sorta large, over six feet in length, that's still just a fraction of the size of Meg. If we think about it logically, wouldn't it be more likely that we would have discovered a giant 60 foot shark that lived around the globe before we found a fish that lived in specific locations and spend a lot of its time hiding in underwater caves? Some people commented about the giant squid, some saying that we used to think the giant squid was a myth until the last 20 years or so, or that until very recently, scientists didn't believe in the giant squid. Well, it's true that the first image of a living giant squid was taken within the last 20 years. We've had the pictures and the carcass of a dead giant squid since 1873, and here's a picture of a more complete specimen from 1896. Carcasses have even washed up hundreds of years before that. Here's a picture from the Smithsonian in 1901 that shows a model giant squid. Here's a picture from London's Natural History Museum from 1906, also showing a model of a giant squid. And both of these models are based on a specimen from 1877. I just wanted to dispel the idea that, until very recently, scientists thought the giant squid was a myth. That's not really accurate. Mainstream science has known the giant squid is real for over 100 years. But what about the colossal squid? Well, the first live specimen was captured in 2007, but the first specimens were discovered from remains in 1925. I made a video that talks a lot more about giant squid if you're interested. Anyway, I do get the point that large creatures can exist in our ocean and be rare, and there are probably many, many more things to discover. I just don't know if the Meg is like the giant squid. Even though giant squid are rare, we still have hundreds that have washed up on the shore, and sometimes they have been partially eaten, but we still find some. The other thing that people have brought up though is, what if the Meg is eating giant squid? Maybe that's its food source. Hmm, I actually found this pretty interesting. Many sharks definitely do eat squid. Could the megalodon survive on a diet like this? Well, considering the size of a megalodon, a single one would need to eat multiple adult giant squid or colossal squid every day. As a side note, colossal squids are mostly found around the southern ocean, so I guess it depends where these potential megs are, but since giant squids are found in all the world oceans, I'm guessing it would be feeding more on them. Okay, so let's try and figure this out. Usually the proponents of living meg theory 
so that there are only a small population of Megalodon left. But how many would you need to sustain a population? I don't know that we can come up with an exact number, but in the field of conservation biology, there is something called the MVP, or Minimum Viable Population. In 1980, Australian geneticist Ian Franklin and American biologist Michael Sewell created the 50-500 rule. Basically, you need at least 50 breeding individuals to stop inbreeding and a minimum of 500 breeding individuals is needed to reduce genetic drift, which are random changes in gene frequencies. Now the 50-500 rule isn't an all-in-one perfect rule that you can just apply to any species. Different factors such as differences in reproductive rates, habitat requirements, and probably a whole bunch of other things will factor in on the actual number. But since we're dealing with a hypothetical here, and we don't really know if these deep sea megs exist, let alone what they are like, let's just go for the 5500 rule for now. So using this very rough guesstimation, we can say that there needs to be a minimum of about 500 breeding megs out there. Now while not all sexually mature individuals will be breeding, all the breeding ones will need to be sexually mature. From previous evidence done on megs, we know they matured at about 25 years, or at least the ones from millions of years ago did. So while not all of these megs need to be about 60 feet, though probably some of them were, the others would still be pretty big. Research suggests they were already over 6 feet at birth. Now the estimated max weight for female giant squid is about 275 kilos, and for males it's about 150 kilos. So it would seem that the megs would each have to probably eat multiple a day, and then altogether they would probably be eating thousands a day, and hundreds of thousands a year. But how many giant squid are there? Well, we don't know for certain, but based on the number of beaks collected from the digestive tracts of sperm whales, scientists estimate there are around 4.3 million giant squids inhabiting the depths of the oceans. It would seem like giant squid populations would be under a lot of pressure if both sperm whales and megalodon were snacking on them. Though there are higher estimates of giant squid populations, some think there may be up to 130 million giant squids. Wow. Well, that is a lot of squid to go around. You'd think, though, that there would be some conflict between sperm whales and the megs. While we see sucker marks from squid on sperm whales, we don't see any meg bites. We also don't have any giant squid carcasses showing up with meg teeth in them. Though, to be fair, if there really are 130 million giant squid out there, then the 600 to 700 samples we have is a pretty tiny sample size. But why would a meg go on a diet of only squid? Many sharks eat squid, but they also eat a variety of prey. Some will say, well, it adapted to the colder waters. Alright, we do think that one of the things that led to the Meg's demise was that the usual cetaceans it preyed upon migrated to colder waters. But if the Meg did adapt to colder waters, why didn't it just go after the dolphins and whales it used to eat? Why did it switch to exclusively eat squid? They haven't been tempted at all to go after a whale in millions of years? Surely a whale would make for a better meal than a giant squid, as hunting one would yield a lot more food than hunting a single squid. I mean, I could see a meg eating squid sometimes. Sharks are opportunistic hunters, but why not also eat bigger food too? It seems like the only reason the meg would stay on an exclusive giant squid diet is that it's intentionally hiding. Again, something I talked about in the original video, but perhaps we can look into this idea a little bit more. So the average depth of the Mariana Trench is about 3,700 meters, and at its deepest parts it goes to 11,000 meters. Just for a bit of context, the estimated range of a giant squid is between 300 and 1,000 meters. When speaking about the megalodon, paleobiologist Megan Bach was asked if it would be possible for big sharks to exist at such extreme depths. She said, Few sharks are known to inhabit the abyssal regions of the ocean below about 4,000 meters, let alone the depths of oceanic trenches lying below 6,000 meters. Aside from the scarcity of food, temperature is another limitation to deep sea living. Now, like I mentioned in the other video, some people think that deep hydrothermal vents could be pumping hot water into the trench. I think this originally came from the science fiction novel The Meg, and I think the author, Steve Alton, believes there might be something to this, 
but I don't know if we have any evidence of it. Again, Megan Bach was asked about this and she said, Life does bloom at hydrothermal vents, although the deepest known hydrothermal vents are only about 5,000 meters deep. But even if there were vents in the deepest trenches, it's not clear there would be enough big species living down there to sustain not just one, but a whole population of massive sharks. So again, all these hypothetical vents would have to sustain an area big enough, not just for the minimum few hundred breeding megs, but also for the large quantities of food they would have to eat every single day. Now some people will say, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. We're saying that it evolved more that it resembles other deep sea sharks like a Greenland shark, a Pacific sleeper shark, or something like the blunt nose six skull shark. Again, let's return to Megan Bach and see what she said about this. She said that sharks that do inhabit deeper parts of the ocean, such as the goblin shark and the Greenland shark, tend to have low metabolic rates. That means they move much more slowly. So I'm guessing we're saying this evolved version of the Meg as a slower deep sea shark, possibly smaller, as some comments have said, still somewhat big, but closer to maybe 30 feet. The slow metabolism and smaller size would help with the food question. The thing about this theory is that we don't really have any evidence for it though. If this did happen, shouldn't we have some of the teeth from some of the descendants in the last 3 million years? Again, a single megalodon would shed 20,000 teeth in its lifetime. Wouldn't its descendants be similar? The other thing that puzzles me, let's say this did happen. The megalodon adapted to live in colder, deeper waters. It became a smaller shark, it hunted different prey, and it had a slower metabolism, and it avoided shallow coastal areas. Okay, but with this many changes, could we still call it a meg? It sort of sounds like it evolved into a different species. Three million years ago on Earth, we didn't have Homo sapiens. We think that the descendants of Australopithecus, or one of its relatives, may have eventually evolved into modern day humans, but we still say that they are extinct. If Megalodon really did evolve into a very different shark, which again, we don't really have any evidence that it did, but if it did, wouldn't we still say that Megalodon is extinct? Now, the other thing some people say is how could a huge super predator like Megalodon go extinct? Well, earlier I mentioned that the oceans were getting cooler, and this is one factor, but there are also other factors and other theories. But since this video is already pretty long, I think that that is a topic for another video. Again, thank you all so much for watching, subscribing, and commenting. It really means a lot. And wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day.